Today we're going to talk about standards, okay, and uh, standards and online instruction. Uh, a lot of times we don't think about our online courses being uh, more of a product than a typical classroom, but that's the kind of picture I want you to have in the back of your mind as we cover these standards. Uh, when we in the industry look at online learning, we look at your courses as actually like a textbook, okay, and you're going to have a physical product that you're producing hopefully before the semester begins and then you're continuously improving, okay? And it's just like standards in any other aspect of our lives, our cars, the tables you're eating at, the chicken that you're eating, they're standards, okay? And if you didn't have those standards, I don't know if you'd be eating that chicken right there if you didn't, if they didn't have standards to hold them up to higher uh, quality, right? So when we go and look at your online courses and we start talking about these standards, keep in mind that uh, it's just like writing a textbook. This is a physical product that you're creating that students are interacting acting with. It is different than the face-to-face -face course that you're teaching. Face-to-face uh, -face, -face is more of a process. Uh, this is actually a physical product that you're producing. So uh, quality matters. <clears throat> We're going to look at it. It's just one of many out there. It is the leading uh, quality assurance or standards uh, type. Uh, we have these other ones out here that are basically, if you take their rubrics, they all kind of bleed off of quality matters in the line. They just have different terminology. Uh, but they all have great standards set forth. But quality matters, what differentiates them is, uh, is their quality research. Everything that they do is based heavily, heavily in research. And it's based and created by faculty, online faculty that have taught for years online. And then they go out and do the research. They have committees set up. And uh, and they'll come together and and every year and a half, two years, they basically look at re revising and updating the rubric. So these standards, when we go through them, have recently in the summer, uh, in June, they started uh, releasing the rubric, and it's actually the newest update. Uh, it's been I don't know, be about a year and a half since they last updated it. But it, that is what's great about it is they don't produce one item and then just let it ride. They're constantly looking at the way education evolves, the pedagogies, the technology, and they're changing with that. So, uh, looking at Quality Matters as far as the organization, uh, it was established in 2003. It was a consortium from Maryland online. Uh, and what they did is they applied for a grant, a federal grant, and they got the funding to, to kind of get the ball rolling. And that, that funded them for a while. And now they are solely a uh, nonprofit organization that, that's fully funded by the, the memberships. So we pay a membership fee, and there's fees that we pay for, for uh, professional development and certifications and stuff like that. So that's what keeps them going now. With their vision, as you can see on the board, uh, Quality Matters is an international organization that is recognized as a leader in quality assurance for online education. Uh, and these, these bullets we're going to go over next is just the center of what drives them. And like I said already, the research, uh, when they develop the rubric, it's based on national standards. It's a, it's a survey of best practices. And then uh, if you go to their website in their research library, you can pull up each standard and look at the literally hundreds to thousands of research articles that would back up each one of these standards. So uh, really there's nothing to argue about as far as there. It's, it's heavily backed by academic research. <clears throat> Student learning. So everything in that rubric is centered on one thing, and that's the student. How effective and efficient the learning process is for the student. Uh, and that's, you know, what's what our end goal is here at Mississippi State. We talk a lot about everything that we do in our courses, but the end, end result is that student being successful. Quality. The review sets a quality goal of 85%, and their idea is we're never going to reach perfection, okay, but we're going to try to get there and make it as excellent or as good as a product as it can get. So it's better than being, what they say, it's better than being good enough. So it's a continuous process. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a one and done type of thing. You don't get your course looked at and then you fail it and then you just give up or it's not that you get it and you pass with an 86% and stop improving it. It's like anything in a face-to-face -face course and online, we need to continually be improving. It's integral. It continues, to, uh, it continues the quality improvement process. It's faculty driven. Everything that you see in that rubric and those standards was identified by online faculty. Uh, it's intended to be diagnostic and collegial, not evaluative or judgmental. And the big thing about quality matters is it's not an evaluation of the teacher. Okay, and I can't stress that enough. 
uh, when we meet <clears throat> and work with faculty, it's and we, we give you suggestions and we show you this is what other people are doing. It's not judging you as the, as the teacher. Nowhere in those standards is it looking at the person. It's only looking at the product, okay? Uh, and so, it, and it's not for identifying the perfect course, and I threw this Vince Lombardi quote in there. It's, it goes back to their vision. Uh, perfection is not attainable, but if we chase it, we can catch excellence. So, uh, that's where we, we're, we're aiming to get to. And this is just a good screenshot of the, the, the continuous process of quality matters and how the system works as far as you develop your course uh, based on the literature, you use the rubric, we have faculty reviewers, hopefully in your own peer reviewers, you know, people that are in your department look at it, give you some feedback. Then it comes down to uh, having it actually looked at by us. We give you some feedback. It goes through a course revision process again, it goes around and completes the circle again. Uh, the last thing you want is stagnant courses. You know, that's in any way we teach, face-to-face -face or online. It should be continual. And this is just a good diagram to kind of show the process. So I'm going to turn it over to Kylie, and she's going to introduce the first couple standards to you. So um, first of all, can everybody hear me? All right, projection's not really my thing but we're working on it. So, before we really delve into the standards, I want you guys to know two things. First of all, you'll notice at your place setting that one of the documents you got has a list, one through eight on the back. Those are the standards. Those are the abbreviated standards for quality matters. If you notice to the side, each one of those standards is associated with a point value. One, two, or three. For quality matters to work, every course that is certified must have every three point standard met. All right? So those are kind of the ones we can't budge on. But you get your pick and choice of the twos and the, and the ones. All of that should add up to 85%. My goal is to hit 95%, but I've been told by some people in the back over there that that's maybe a little ambitious. But you know, we'll try. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is that you're probably gonna see a little bit of cyclical information here, and that's okay, because each of the standards sort of touches on similar themes, but a different facet each time. All right, so if things start to get a little repetitive, I do apologize but that is the nature of quality matters. All right, so hold on to your hats. Let's get started. Okay, so our first standard, this is the course overview and introduction. Um, this is the easiest standard. It's what I like to call the getting started standard. And so essentially when you meet this standard, you're looking at things like, can people navigate your course? Is there some information about the course? And do you provide the basic knowledge your students need to successfully complete the course? Okay. So essentially, here's what this means for you guys. This is the easiest standard to complete. Um, it's fewer questions about that syllabus stuff, right? Because in this standard, you're looking at, is there a syllabus? Do students know how to get in touch with you? Do they know what courses they should have taken before they take this course? Is there a textbook? Do you introduce yourself and do you allow your students to introduce themselves to each other? All right. All of that stuff, by the way, you're probably already doing. So kudos to you guys. Congratulations. You met standard one. Okay. Now, it sounds really simple to us, right? This is stuff we most likely already do. However, here's what it does for our students. So, it lessens their anxiety. I don't know if you've ever been an online student or if you've ever talked with one, but they get nervous just like our face-to-face -face students do and perhaps even more because we're not there to really physically guide them through something. So they're on their own a lot and they get nervous. If your course is navigatable, 
it frees up your students time because the truth is our students may only have about two or three hours a week to work on any one given course so what would you rather have a student who spends an hour of their two hours a week trying to find stuff in your course and an hour with the content you're trying to teach them or a student who gets to spend two hours on the content because they know where everything's located right so it frees up their time it establishes class relationships which I can't tell you is so important all right we meet our students in face-to-face -face classes we meet them they see us they see we're real people right they see their classmates are real people too so they know they're not alone this standard makes sure that we're doing the same thing for our online students because when you feel connected and part of a community and part of a classroom you're more likely to seek help if you need it and you're more likely to succeed and then finally which is a good thing for us as instructors right it sets course expectations so you're gonna get less emails about well where's quiz one where's that video can you show me how to submit something all right if you establish that early on and make it really obvious where these things are you're gonna get way less of those types of questions which frees up your time as well all right so that's the first standard now standard two this one is learning objectives and competencies this one I call the learning standard because it's all about student learning um, this one is probably the most difficult because if you look at your card every single one of the substandards is worth three points and that's because this is the basis for your entire course from the overarching what are students learning why are they taking this to what are they learning every time I ask them to read something or every time I give a quiz all right so again it concerns what students are learning it concerns how that learning is measured so what are you doing to prove that they learned something and then also how are you linking what you're teaching and what you're asking your students to do to what they should know which is super important so here's what this means for us as teachers so it means that you have to provide for your students what a successful student will be able to know or do at the end of the course and please note it says successful right because we will have unfortunately unsuccessful students but this is just a reasonable expectation of what most of your students will be able to do or to know um, you should provide when in the course students will be gaining specific knowledge and skills so not only do you have objectives that overarch the entire semester but you have individual chapter unit objectives explaining hey you're gonna read this chapter you're gonna learn this section of material and then you're gonna be able to do this the next thing is you're gonna have to explain how you will determine if students have gained knowledge or skills so which assessments link back to which objectives and are they valid okay but what does this actually mean for your students so this offers them a literal map of what they should be getting out of your course okay it reinforces the importance of your content so no more of this well I don't know why I'm learning this they just told me I had to take it right how many times have you heard that it also reinforces the importance of the work you're having them do no more of that well I don't know why we have to write this paper it doesn't actually go with anything I learned kind of a thing it puts what we expect in their terms because sometimes when we work in academia right we have this this habit of talking to everybody like we would talk to our peers right which our students don't always understand and so this standard says that everything we write must be written for the student 
So it puts what we expect of our students in their terms. And then finally, it's proven when you have all of these things in place, your students are going to be more engaged because they're going to know what and why they're learning something. And they're also going to be way more motivated to do well because nothing is arbitrary anymore. They know where everything is, what it counts for, and why it matters. So it actually really improves how your students learn. All right, moving on. So standard three is assessment and measurement. I call it the grading standard. And it's essentially concerned with what are you assigning to your students and how are you evaluating them. Um, it leaks your grading policy to your grading procedure. And then it links student learning to assessment. Okay, so what this means for you is that you have to provide your students a clear outline of how you grade, how those individual grades affect the overall course grade, and then how those assignments contribute to learning. Now we're getting into the cyclical part. It also says you must provide multiple um, types of assessment. So you can't just have quizzes. Does anybody here know that you're a, like a poor test taker? I am. I get nervous. When I see the clock running, I just start clicking answers like crazy. The GRE was a bad experience for me. I don't know that it's pleasant for anybody. Um, I much prefer to write. I know some people hate writing. But the point is, you have to give your students the opportunity to try something they're good at, to demonstrate what they know. Because trust me, they know something. It may just be that we're not asking the right questions. It also requires that we provide, provide timely and consistent feedback. So we set up an expectation for students. If we say we're gonna grade a quiz in a week, we grade a quiz in a week, and we continuously do that because it benefits our students. And here's how it does that. So first of all, here's what this does for your students, but also keep in mind this is kind of doing some stuff for you too, right? Um, how many times have you guys gotten an email that says, well, when's my paper gonna be graded? Uh, where do I find it? Do you give it back yet? I maybe threw it away in the trash can on the way out of class, but do you give it back yet? Kind of a thing. So essentially, when you provide all of these guidelines for students, they are no longer going to ask you, well, how are you grading this? When are you going to finish it grading? When are you going to finish grading it? And then where do I find it? You're going to set all of those expectations, and students are going to look for the same patterns every single time which means less questions to answer for us. This also allows your students actual chances to build knowledge, right? Because someone may not be good at writing, they may not can show you what they know in writing, but man, they can ace a multiple choice test. So you've got to give them that opportunity. By the way, this also gives them a chance to showcase to you that they know something and let me just tell you, when they know something, they want you to know they know it. <laughs> All right, right? We want them to be happy. We want them to show us what they learned. So it's really good for our students to do all these things. Okay, standard four is what I like to call the content standard, and it's instructional materials. And so this is kind of concerned with, are you using good quality sources to teach your material? Are you connecting what you're teaching with to your objectives? And then are you ethically using the materials you have sourced? All right. And really the big thing to take away here is that we want up-to-date content over stuff that's reused and recycled because all of our fields change, right? So we want to stay up with that. All right. So here's what this means for you guys. You have to present your content in more than one format. It can't just be a PowerPoint, and it can't just be a video. Because much like with assessment, people tend to do better with certain types of media. 
I like to read but I know other people like to watch videos. So you have to provide that sort of opportunity for people to do and to learn the best way that they can. You have to make sure your content aligns with your learning objectives. There's nothing quite like being a student and getting a test and the content that you're tested on is not something that was covered in class. All right. Nothing quite like that particular feeling. Same idea. The content you teach must then be represented in the assessment you're offering. And then finally, and here's the biggie, because this has implications further than the university, is that we have to be sure we're adhering to academic rigor and copyright law. All right? So we ask our students to cite things. How many of you guys have had a student who cited something wrong or just didn't cite at all? That old plagiarism bug. All right. Um, we have to do it too. And this standard holds us to that. Now, here's what that means for your students. First of all, it provides an actual working model of academic rigor. So if we're going to ask a student to cite something, we better be citing it too to show them how it's done. We are also, when we update our content, allowing our students to be competitive, right? Because you can't be competitive in a job market with old information. You just can't be. We have to have our students engage with content in different ways. So we want to provide them as many chances as we can and as in as many ways as is feasible. We also want content that allows students to actually succeed in the course. Again, making sure that what we teach is what we assess. All right, Chris, I think you're doing the next one. Thank you. All right, I wanted to cover standard five. This is a passion of mine. It was one of my areas of research in my dissertation, and that is the interaction. So standard five is really about interaction and the learner activities. And that term learner activities kind of encloses uh, quizzes. Uh, it's not exams per se, but it's like formative assessments get to be thrown in there, the practice, the homework. And actually, when we start talking about standard two being the hardest for faculty and course designers to do, Standard five is actually relatively easy, but it's also the one that's the easiest or the most overlooked. It's easy for us to kind of forget to do these things. Um, and it's a big part of nationwide. Um, one of the things that lead to students not having success in the course. And so with this standard, we're looking at uh, how all of our activities in the class, like I said, that those practice activities you're giving them, the discussion boards, the homework, uh, the group work, all those things, how do they align to our objectives and our assessments? And one thing I failed to mention introducing Quality Matters is if you don't have strong objectives or written according to Quality Matters and they do not align with the assessments, the activities, um, and everything in the, is in the course, you know, you, you wouldn't pass. So if somebody was reviewing your course, you, all these things have to align. Uh, and so the big thing with this one is, is a lot of times we have students, we try to take something we did maybe in our face-to-face -face class and we try to do them in our online class and they don't really tie in to what we're doing. Uh, I've been guilty of this in teaching myself, um, you know, trying to convert something over to an online class from face-to-face -face, and I do it because I'm comfortable with it. But it's not the best assignment or best activity for my students because it doesn't transpose well in the online environment. And in our assessments, make sure that what they're doing is, is practice to make them stronger for our end result and that's an assessment. Activities include interaction. So we want you to create, and the standard wants you to create, activities that have, the, have students talking to one another. That's why discussion boards, video discussion boards in Canvas are awesome. Uh, have them interact, talk. Uh, interaction is defined as you know anything that the student does with the course with other students and with you as the instructor. So there's three types of you know, interactions. And that's what we want. We want those activities to involve a little bit of each one of those, okay? Uh, just producing, you know, reading and then take a quiz, that's, 
that's only one of the three aspects of interaction. They're not talking to anybody else. They're not working with anybody else. And so this activity, um, when they work together and have peer tutoring, it, it really helps out solidify the learning process. Active learning. Now that's defined much broader, and I can't go into everything in that, but um, basically if you have the student do something, create something in your course in an online environment, that's how we define active learning. So in my classes that I teach, students do projects. I do not do a lot of multiple choice quizzes. I do not do a lot of tests. Mine are where they have to record themselves presenting. They have to work with group members and build something, a PowerPoint or a Prezi, or uh, they do a case study interaction and tape themselves. So it's, it's, that is active learning. That's something if they do it, they're more apt to remember it. And then the biggest one is communication and feedback. Uh, Kylie already kind of mentioned the feedback part on assessments. Um, I know is I completed two degrees online and I've had faculty members go five, six weeks without giving me feedback on a graded assignment. And each week, it was one of those assignments that built up to the next. So by week six, I got my first feedback and I was just crossing my fingers that I was doing things right because I already turned in five other assignments. And that's, that's a big part of this interaction. Uh, you providing feedback, whether it's just, hey, you did a great job on this, keep up the great work. There's, there's students online just like we treat them face to face. They like to get compliments. So your feedback doesn't always have to be negative. It doesn't have to be corrective. But reaching out to them and saying, hey, I'm really enjoying your post or I'm really enjoying your papers that you're doing to me, it really goes a long way with these online students. So, what does this mean for you? Uh, if, if all these things are done correctly, you're going to have a much increased performance out of your students. Okay, over the long run, you're going to see a better quality uh, submission process. Your paper is going to be better. Your homework is going to be better. Um, when these students feel like they're important, that you care for them, that you're there checking on them, emailing them just to say, "Hey, I know she hadn't logged in in a week and a half. What's wrong?" All of a sudden, now they're starting to log in and do their work. It's, it's just a process. Uh, it easily identifies students who do not get it. We can't see that. I can't look in the, I can look in the audience right now and see your face and kind of get an idea of what you're thinking or what you're feeling. You can't do that in an online class. Uh, so when you get out there and you start interacting with them and, and throwing those lines out there to see who responds and what's going on, um, that does help you kind of get an idea of uh, if, you're, if you're fishing for that information, sometimes you'll get it, okay? Uh, increased engagement is one we've kind of already discussed, but you know, if you do this right and you have discussion boards or video posts, uh, short video lectures, stuff like that, or video announcements, these students are engaged in the content and we can look at the analytics and see that they're actually watching everything and clicking more and going deeper into our, our content and our modules. Strong sense of community, Kylie already uh, represented that. Students are motivated. They're going to do a lot better if they feel like they're a part of a cohort. Uh, I've went through several cohorts in my academic career. Uh, working with the same students, you build those relationships and you tend to do better. You, work, you, 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 you kind of figure out who you can work with well and uh, you, build, you kind of build off their strengths and you learn from one another. So that's what we want in our online classes. It's not all about, I'm going to do it all by myself. You'll have those students. They don't want to be any part of a community. They just want to do all their stuff on their own, and that's okay. But we, a vast majority of learners want to feel like they're a part of something. So what does this standard mean for students? Uh, Kylie hit the motivation part of it. Uh, when we start linking our assignments, and everything to the objectives, it brings in relevance. And I can't stress that enough as far as learners. If they're in your class because they know they have to take this freshman introductory 101 class just because they have to take it, and they don't know why they have to take it, they're not gonna do well. And I, as a student, can link, think back years ago as a freshman, I was taking all these intro courses. I knew I was never gonna be a history teacher. I was never gonna teach algebra. I didn't do well in those classes because I couldn't see the relevance at the time. But you start looking at students when they get into their second semester, sophomore, junior, and senior years, and they're taking those core classes, and then faculty members are telling them, look, you're going to have to use this when you get out in the field, and this is why they do better. So it's the relevance that's the key here. It identifies the desired end result. It's like anything with goal setting. If I know where I want to be, where we're going while we're learning this, uh, it increases motivation. Uh, we benefit from feedback and peer tutoring. And feedback is an integral part of the learning process and what we do in the cognitive sciences. And, and I can't stress that enough as far as you taking the time, and especially with Canvas coming, you can give audio or video feedback. It's very easy, very quick. Uh, and I think you'll really find that tool useful. 
Uh, increase in motivation, we've already talked about that. You'll have better outcomes and better students. And that should be it, going to course technology. So I'll turn it back over to Kylie. All right. Awesome. And so thank you guys for sitting through. The first five standards are probably the most dense. From here on out, you guys just get to breeze through and link to some stuff for your students. Yay. Okay. So standard six is course technology. I like to call this one the LMS standard because it's literally just about the tech you're using in your course, which for most people is going to be Canvas <laughs> come spring. And really the idea behind this standard is, are you using the right tool for the right task? And it's the same concept that applies when you wouldn't use a hammer when you should use a screwdriver kind of a thing. Okay, and so what this means for you is that you just have to make sure that the tools are functioning that so you're using in your classroom, in Blackboard, in Canvas, are appropriate for the subject you're covering and for the task you're trying to complete. All right, are you using a quiz when maybe you should be doing some sort of a written assignment? Are you using a tool just because it's cool? Because if so, maybe you shouldn't be. That kind of an idea. Um, another thing is, are you offering your students a chance to use tools? All right, a lot of times online students get the chance to download a PowerPoint, watch a video, and take a quiz. There's not a lot of tools. Have you ever asked them to make a video, make an audio file, take a picture, draw a picture, all right? Um, are you allowing them the opportunities that you can to try something new and to even see if they like it and what's even better if they're really good at it. And then the last part of this is that we just have to reassure our students that we're not selling their information, right? I don't have an online course in which I'm taking my roster and sending it to 21 apartments to get them to live there kind of a thing, all right? Um, so what does this do for your students? It promotes active learning, right? The more students are doing things rather than passively watching or listening, the more they're learning. It gives them the opportunity to try different technologies. Um, I've been working with Canvas for the past three months and I've been working with faculty. And let me just tell you, we're getting this really awesome video tool called ARC. I've seen at least 10 people who never use video use this tool and these are professors and they're really excited. Your students are going to be just as excited to try something new. And then the last thing, it gives them confidence in you and in us as an institution that we're not selling them out. All right. Okay. The next standard is the learner support standard. This is the policy standard. And the next, this one and the next kind of go together. And so what this is concerned with is are we, for our online students, showing them that they have institutional resources that will support them? Are we showing them how to find it and that they're there? And essentially this is the what can you do or what can we do to help your students kind of a thing. And so what this means for you which, back to the syllabus again, right? You gotta show that we have student support services. You just have to let your students know that we have it. Um, are you linking to the Writing Center, the Learning Center, or any other support service that is relevant to the content in your class? Are you also determining which campus resources can help your students, right? So. If you have a large writing component to your course, you should probably provide a link to the writing center. If you have a large final art project, maybe not so much. Try the learning center, all right? But are you kind of determining yourself what your students could possibly need and where they can go to find that help? And then you'll notice on here it says accessibility policy, right? Everybody here is familiar with ADA? Okay. So it's asterisk right now because we are required by Quality Matters to provide an accessibility statement in our online courses. 
We as a university do not yet have one. So it's coming. We just don't have it yet. All right. But it just requires that you put that statement in your syllabus as well. Okay. So what does this mean for your students? It gives them a broader network to lean on. And it also gives them a bigger sense of belonging, right? It gives them access to helpful resources that we as their professors can't really provide for them, either because we're not trained or because we don't know. It gives them access to information, and information is power. We want our students to be informed. You know, we don't always know what's going on in their lives. We don't always know what's going on with them. But the very least we can do is give them the option to seek the help they need if they need it. And also, man, it's just reassurance. It's all those warm, cuddly feelings you get when you know someone is out there saying, hey, we got you. All right. And then here's standard eight. And this is accessibility and usability. And we'll go ahead and say, Blackboard has a lot of problems with this, but Canvas kind of solves a lot of them. So woohoo. I like to call this one the legal standard or the ADA standard. And essentially, with this particular standard, what you need to know is, is your course easy to navigate and to use? And then, can anybody access it? All right? Anybody. And the tagline here is inclusivity, not exclusivity. And so, what this means for you is that you have to check all of your documents and images to make sure they are accessible. Are you providing alternative tags? Are you providing searchable PDFs? Are you using accessible fonts and colors? Some of our students use machines that read the text on the computer for them. Those machines can't always pick up the cool decorative fonts we like to use. Same thing with color. Some of our students can't discern color very well. And so if we're using a color scheme that doesn't work for them, what do they do? It means providing alternative means to access your multimedia. So if you have an audio clip, do you provide text for your students who can't hear to read? If you have students who can't see, are you providing audio for them to hear, right? So everybody can access everything in the course. And essentially what this does for your student is that it means that everybody can interact with your course, all right? It means that everybody can take it and can be successful. It actually just means less confusion in general because you don't have to like weed through the decorative fonts anymore. You can just see what needs to be said. And again, it's increased engagement and motivation. All right, so last couple of slides and then we'll open to questions. And so the last thing I kind of want to talk about is what we have at MSU to help you with quality matters. And so the first thing is that we have several certified quality matters rubric readers. So that one sheet you have, I have a 50 page workbook in my office that's all of those things annotated. It's like one per page. So we've been trained and we know how to use this rubric and what quality matters is looking for. We do internal course reviews at MSU. So that means if you want your course to be quality matters certified, it'll come through CDE and CTL. Um, we both help with the process, but CTL controls the final review and it's free. It's completely free. All right. And so what I wanted to talk to you guys about last is this. So here's what I can offer you as a component of the Center for Distance Education. And so keep in mind, this can work any way you want it to. Um, you kind of tell me what you're interested in and we'll set up a plan. But typically, the way we would start is I would ask to do a preliminary review of the course you're wanting certified. And so I would go in, review it, and provide you with an initial score and comments. After that, I can be as hands-on or off 
as you want um, until we meet that 85%. We'll then do another, like I call it the post-help review, to see and be sure that we've met it. And then once we've done that, I'll help you submit it to Chris for final approval. And yeah. I'll add, I'll add one thing. It's not a fast process, okay? So if you do want somebody to look at your course, if you send it to Kylie, it's not something that we look at and get back to you in two or three days. It's looking at every piece of information in that course. So very time consuming. So just be prepared for that. I just want to know uh, approximately how long does it take? Uh, oh, if you pay for one, it could take five weeks for it to get done, and that's people working on it as a team. I've, I usually, it's taken me over, now it's not the only thing that we do, so we have to slide it into our schedules, and I don't want to put us in a box, but I've done them in a week and a half to two weeks is usually, uh, it all depends on what all's going on, but uh, it, it's, it's a very intensive process. The old rubric we were using was internal, and it wasn't as in depth. We would take little samples of your course and look at one assessment. This requires you to go into every folder and every assignment to review every piece in that course. It usually takes me about a week. Yeah, one more. Then if, if it is certified and you make changes because you just said that you have to up update your syllabus and, and the assignment, then you have to recertify, is that, is that correct? So, for example, with the second, let's just take the second standard where all of the, the substandards are really important. If I see something right off the bat that I'm like, yeah, it's probably not going to meet the standard, I'll email you immediately and say, let's specifically work on this for now, and while you work on that, I'll continue the review. Thank you. It seems to me that uh, the active learning and the, all the quality standards require a lot of work. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on how to match the activities required with the credit amount, where, or should we incorporate them all into the exam so that we justify? Because students will probably come back and say, well, "This is the eight credit course," because you are requiring a lot. You're not going to like my answer. Um, now, um, if, if it was me and my answer, I would say that every course you teach should have an equal amount of rigor. Now, we expect better quality the higher up we go in the course. Uh, as far as the activities is, is concerned, I mean, if you're looking at an intro level 100, 1,000 level course, whatever you want to call it, I, I would still assign the same amount of activities, but it wouldn't be at a, a, as depth of knowledge that I'm reaching for on the student. Um, active learning in an online course requires a lot of work. It does, and I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, this process is not usually something that, that happens in one semester. This is something that's continual. You may not get but you know, one, two, three units done in a semester, and then we work on the next three in the next semester. Um, it's hard to put a gauge on that. What you do, as far as as far as I can answer this question legally for SACS accreditation, is the rigor in your online class and contact hours has to equate to what it does in the face-to-face -face course. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can put on paper and justify it, and that's what we're the UCCC process is going to start requiring for the syllabi. Um, Every unit, you're going to have to have those Carnegie hours out there on the side. And so in a breakdown, if me and you are working together personally, I would want to see in this unit, where are they going to do three hours worth of work on their own time? And that could be you're watching a 10-minute video, uh, reading the textbook, may let's say 30 minutes, uh, doing this exercise may take them an hour. And so we, we break that down individual and Carnegie hours for SACS accreditation. But overall, the active learning process, you you would get a feel for what worked, and I don't really rec I don't really care what my students complain about as far as it takes. They don't I mean they don't really complain about the time if they do well on it and they learn. So I don't put a whole lot of weight on that personally. I mean, if I overloaded them, they would let me know soon, and I would adjust that the next semester. And it may be something that you have to do over a couple of semesters practicing with it to kind of find that balance. And, you want to add? and I would say if you're thinking about the workload for yourself, right, because online courses are inherently more work, remember it's a, it's a design, not delivery. So once you build it, it's done. 
Um, and it's it's way more time to build it, but I also would say that's maybe way less time on the back end of the semester, if that makes sense. So it's a lot of work before, maybe not quite as much throughout. Um, I just had a question about where it says that learning activities provide opportunities for interaction. Um, that, that includes interaction with instructor and other, other students. So in my course, I, I have weekly online office hours and I have a discussion board as well, but they're not mandatory activities, but would that still count as an activity that allows opportunity yeah. for that interaction? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the opportunity is there for them to get in there and do it. And I will tell you that if there's no points assigned to a discussion, they're probably not going to do it. Um, but the opportunity is there, and I, if it was me working with you, I would suggest making this worth a certain amount of points, and, and we could talk about that. Um, yeah, that given the interaction back and forth, uh, you could. there's a lot of opportunities there that we could dress that up and make it stronger uh, but just having office hours is it's it, it meets one of the check marks but it's not something that we would count as a strong form of interaction okay. because students typically don't come to those even though we offer them we have to offer them but they usually don't they don't come to them unfortunately and keeping in mind so like you know the overall standard is 85 percent right for each of the substandards if we look at it and say oh it's 85 percent there we're going to count it okay yeah and then I just had another question as well. Um, I mean, I think it's worthwhile getting certified anyway, but does Mississippi State have any plans to make this mandatory for their online courses at any point in the future? I don't know about the future. I, can't, I mean, it's right now, this is all voluntary. It's asking, it's just like it is in your face-to-face -face classes, and that wouldn't be a decision that e anybody here really can make. Let's faculty senate would make that decision. Um, you know, the only thing we've made required is the CTL 101 certification to get you ready, which we have revised it, and I'm offering it next week for the first time centered on the standards um, but no right now it's just like you're teaching face to face we want you to do the best and these set standards right here could actually help you improve and actually the faculty that go through this actually improve their face to face courses also but no right now I, have, I haven't personally heard anything Dr. Seal have you heard anything so it's just totally voluntary How many courses have been certified this far? Officially, we haven't sent any in to Quality Matters that have paid for one. Now, I've done internal reviews for tenure and promotion packets. I've done a handful of those based on the Quality Matters pa uh, program. Kylie's working with some. I'm not going to speak for her, but what she will do is, in the process, is, is she would work with that faculty member, hands-on, helping them, send it to us. We'd give it one more good look around as working as a team. But then you have to pay if you want it to be stamped Quality Matters and be legally be able to use that seal to mark it your program we have to pay quality matters and we haven't paid them anything yet that I'm aware of and while we have to pay for their seal right uh, we don't have to pay anything to do the internal review and that makes sure we have the exact same standards um, and keeping in mind that CTL 101 our distance orientation are all going to be quality matters certified at some point within the semester is that, a, is that a cost that our department has to cover? Yes. As far as I know, and Dr. Seal may add anything, but right now, as far as the cost, it's a marketing expense, basically, on your department to say, when you're recruiting, we offer these courses, we're all quality uh, matters approved, and it's, it's a quality check mark. Because it's going to be a departmental decision. I mean, there may be some courses or even programs, because they will certify programs as well, that you may decide from a competitive advantage or for whatever reason, we want this certified. Um, just like we talked about with CTL 101 and our, our orientation, we feel like we need to have our program certified um, just to kind of set that standard. But So it's a departmental decision. But just because it doesn't bear the official quality matter stamp doesn't mean we can't advertise that we don't have quality programs. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Somebody asked a question about the discussion board, and you said um, um, it doesn't really count. Uh, I'm asking, uh, what about uh, Blackboard Collaborate, where you do posting and students can, in, can interact, just posting their comment and asking questions and receiving feedback? How does it factor in terms of uh, uh, active learning and student interaction? It, it does. I, I don't want to 
Now, let's just clarify. I was just talking about offering virtual office hours. Just offering the virtual hours it alone is not going to meet that interaction component as well. I meant the discussion board is a huge, huge plus in, in the standards. So the discussion board is a great tool. Keep using it. Use it more. And um, uh, keeping in mind that we're, in, we're evaluating these things. We're looking at every, literally everything. And so we have to... We can't factor maybe one particular thing, but we have to factor everything all together. And so if you're using a synchronous delivery and you're using it, let's say, weekly, every Wednesday at 4 p.m., you're logging in and you're offering these class uh, synchronous live sessions, that's a great plus. If you did it once in the semester, though, that would come into the consideration of, well, they only did this once. And does it really meet that 85% uh, success rate as, as far as meeting this standard? And there's some chat boxes we have to go out. So using different forms is what we highly recommend of communication um, and not that you have to do one every week but it has to be enough to where it, it meets that standards as far as a minimum occurrence okay. um, you talk about payment assuming the department doesn't have money to pay uh, do you have to pay something uh, on internal certification no nope. no we offer it free for anybody who wants it oh, okay thank you <laughs>